everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Leadership Blend Television Show with your amazing host, Ricardo Rice. Now, I know y'all see all these amazing, distinguished gentlemen sitting over here. You're probably wondering, what are you doing now? Well, we're actually starting a panel discussion with different black men to talk about what's going on in not only the black community, with our black brothers. And this one, we're talking about education. So I brought in the best and the brightest, two of which you've already seen before on previous episodes of the television show. But I'm going to let them introduce themselves, starting from my left. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason B. Allen. I am a 17-year educator. Um, I've done everything in education from administration to currently teaching special education. And we need more uh, male educators of color in this field. We're still at 2%. Um, and so I'm, I'm advertising, actually, Profile Gentlemen. That's the sweatshirt that I'm wearing, uh, where we highlight activists, educators, to empower uh, and encourage our younger brothers to come into the field. So, that's why. Uh, my name is Frank Brown. I'm the proud CEO of Communities and Schools of Atlanta. It's a dropout prevention organization that actually started here in Atlanta and now it's spread to 26 states, including the District of Columbia. And here in Atlanta, we serve almost 31,000 kids, uh, 2,500 of those kids on our caseload. And our mission is very simple uh, to surround kids with a community support and power in the state school and achieve their life. So, um, as a black man, there are very few black men who run anything in Atlanta. Uh, so I understand the responsibility of being a community leader, but also to be a business leader, too, because a nonprofit at the end of the day must have bottom lines that are able to pay people and, and do good and carry out their mission. So i uh, really interested to hear you know, what my colleagues have to say, what Mercado has to say, but I think it's, it's a worthwhile conversation because there are a lot of assumptions here in Atlanta about uh, black men and, and what we do, and, and it is much more diverse than people can ever imagine. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Shelton Good. I am the CEO and president of Icarus Consulting. We specialize in helping companies uh, become a, a little bit more diverse, a little bit more equitable, and a little bit more inclusive. I use those words intentionally um, because it's not something that you can do overnight. It's, a, it's something that you have to do and work on every day. So as my, my fellow um, panel members and my brothers have talked about this challenge of um, increasing uh, diversity. And I know um, here in Atlanta, we, we tend to um, look at this through a lens of privilege. You can't look um, anywhere in the metro area and not see a healthy representation of African Americans. The question is, are they in uh, corporations, particularly in positions of power in decision making? Um, you're going to hear some amazing stats um, that even in 2021, how the lack of representation, particularly in corporate, uh, uh, corporate America, particularly here in Atlanta, specifically as it pertains to um, black men, the, uh, the lack of uh, leadership, the lack of African-American men in leadership in corporate. So looking forward to our conversation. I feel like you just tried to start the whole conversation. <laughs> you you slick did that, but it's okay. There will be a lot of kicks and giggles today. It's a part of what we do, so just sit back and enjoy. All right, so I'm going to start with Jason, because when we were talking before this, you were talking about the root of education. Can okay. you respond upon that for me? So when we think about the numbers of, of males that are in education, of course it's lower than white women, um, black women. Then we have white men that actually surpass black and other males of color uh, in the field. And so when I'm talking to my students, particularly about how do we change uh, what school looks like in the pandemic, how do we reimagine schools, there's not a lot of youth or students at the table, but there's also not a lot of brothers at the table either. And so, you know, when we look at the history of education, education is still in 2021 classified as a pink college job. It's not just educators or teachers, um, it's social workers, counselors, a lot of the jobs that connect with uh, human administration or public administration are classified as pink collar jobs. But we also see the detrimental impacts of males not being in the home or males not being in classrooms or males not being in positions where they're leading nonprofits um, or foundations for Coke or Walmart, et cetera, and so forth. And so um, how we label things, you know, unfortunately in our society in America, does make a difference in the outcomes that we see in our society, especially when we look at children of color. So let me ask, because when I was 
very long time ago, before I graduated school, we had a lot of the HBCUs have teaching programs. I think Clapham had one called Call Me Mister, things of that nature. Yeah. Are those, I know that one's still around. Do we need more of those programs? Or is this is a wider problem? And then you start talking about wraparound services, things of that magnitude, stuff I wasn't familiar with, because we didn't really have those things, and I'm from South Carolina, the country. It wasn't really things that we needed, but they seem to be needed now. So is there a need to like revamp a lot of these programs or create new programs? What, what are we looking at? I'm all about dismantling the system. You know, I have to be honest in these spaces because people that have leverage, who have power, who have influence, need to know that we keep trying to push children into a system that we know was not created for them to succeed. So when we look at the workforce, you know, I've sat in meetings with Ann Kramer with the you know, Atlanta Regional Commission, and I've been the only educator in the room. And so you think about Target and Walmart and Home Depot and you know, major media companies that come into the city of Atlanta and say, well, we spend so much money on the workforce, the high turnover, because we have workers who don't have the skill set. They don't have the foundational skills needed to sustain these jobs. Well, it all impacts education and what's being taught. Um, you know, to our children, but also how they're being taught. So to answer your question, no, we don't need more programs. We need to change how teachers are being trained, which are the pipeline, the pipeline that teachers go through, uh, especially in the state of Georgia. I know you mentioned, you know, checking out my blog, and I shared my experience last year in taking on the state because it was found that, you know, the program that teachers have to be certified in, the test had racial bias. And so there's a program. And so you mean to tell me with everything that's happening in society, I have to go through a program where I'm spending my own money and it's oppressing me? So how many teachers do you think have wanted, wanted to go through that and then come in to a system that's already not allowing the innovation needed to reach our children? So yes, we don't need more programs. We need to change the pipeline of how teachers are being trained. And that's the work of Profound Children and other organizations across the nation. Okay, let me shift to Frank. Frank, when you were with me previously, uh, we talked about, which really shocked me and actually threw me to a loop, uh, the money that your organization was given, that a lot of that went to COVID funerals. Yeah. Um, and, and kids not logging in. What does that look like? Because you were with me, that was last year. Yeah, I mean, what does that look like now? I mean, year to date, uh, we've given out over $566,000. Uh, the number one category since I talked to you is now housing. 71% of that money went to housing. Uh, over 2,500 requests. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting point because in Atlanta, I don't think we have a problem. Most of the principals that I deal with are black. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in APS, in Fulton County, in Clayton County, a lot of them are black men. Uh, we do have representation of, of blacks. I think Atlanta might be a little bit outsized because of this demographical makeup of Atlanta. And it might not be the same in Montgomery, it might not be the same in Orlando. But here in Atlanta, there is a kind. I think for me, uh, the big issue is what kind of a hand educators have. They're not going to schools like Woodward. They're going into schools that are consumed with poverty. You mentioned wraparound services. we got to look at how education is funded here in the state. It's property taxes. So if you're in a zip code that doesn't have a high property tax base like a high in Cobb County, your schools will reflect that. Um, so when you have low tax bases, the school, that's not a place that the best teachers want to go and teach. That's not the place where you're, Fulton County had a program where they were paying teachers an extra 20000 to go to the south side, from the north side. They couldn't get nobody to take the money. So it's about the environment the schools are in. I don't care if you, you're going to have to have a Joe Clark type figure all across because that's the type of human capital it would take to turn those situations around. So for us, we're making it easier for principals. When I pay for a housing situation, that child's still in school. That parent does not jack them out, move someplace else, which is true. I mean, we have the, 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 the rates of kids moving, the mobility rate, we get 60% in South Fulton. They will start at one school, and by the end of the year, they would have been in two or three other different schools. But you cannot run from the fact that you can have as many black men in there as you want. But if the poverty is just so overwhelming, and I don't have a home. Think about this. We're talking about virtual learning. If a housing was my biggest issue, it doesn't matter if I have a laptop, if I don't have a stable place to look at this stuff and have Wi-Fi. 40% of Hispanic kids in America homes don't have computers. 
That was before the crisis. Uh, so for us, it has to be about the underlying community <coughs> factors. The educators weren't prepared to do wraparound supports. To your point, we were growing up, CIS has been around for 50 years, but this poverty now, the major, first time in America's history, the majority of the kids in America's public school system now qualify for free and reduced lunch. That means the majority of the kids are poor. That means that they're, you see what I'm saying? People with means, even people of color, are taking their kids and putting them in pace in Woodward. People, he'll tell you, like, uh, it, 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 so there's even a classism here in Atlanta. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Because Absolutely. there are more black people in Atlanta making over $200,000 than any other city, but most of us are, my, are, 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 are transplants. Mm -hmm. So there's an underbelly of permanent poverty here. That no matter how many Maynard Jacksons or Kasim Reeds, or it doesn't change. And I think that's the frustration we see in our work, is that there's no commitment to changing, not just systems, but absolute pathways. This is one of the few cities that your zip code will dictate your outcome. If you're born in certain zip codes, there's a 4% chance of getting out. That's empirical data that we see here. And that's why the city has been called the income inequality capital of the country for the last two years. Not San Francisco, not Greenwich, Connecticut, not Miami, Florida, not Houston, Texas, not LA. It's right here. Despite the majority of the leadership in this area looking like me and you. So how can that be? We have kids who are being pushed through systems who can't read. And so it's not in the school's interest to float them because they get penalized in their CCRPI score. So if you've got poor kids who have third grade reading levels but they're in a ninth grade class, what do you expect that high school to do? I don't care if you had Joe Clark, Marla Collins, and everybody in the saints of education there. I mean, this is really bad because we have generation. There was a study by Redefine Ed. It said only three out of ten black kids will be proficient in reading and math after COVID because we have three million kids who've never come back since March. So it's a serious issue. Very serious. <laughs> I was going to shift to you. We will take a break because I know you're not going to be short. So we're going to take our first break, and when we come right. back, we'll have more of this amazing panel on the Leadership Land Television Show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. So we were back with my, my great guest, and we were starting to paint this picture of education. Um, listening to Jason and Frank, I feel like now I want to shift to Dr. Good about equity and equality, because now that's become a center focus. So let's get into that. What exactly is equity and uh, inclusion and all that good stuff? Let's start there with you. Okay. So um, let's start with diversity. Diversity is a lot of people think about it primarily as race and gender orientation. But it's, it's much bigger than that. It can be background experience, okay? In any corporation, any organization, you, you, diversity is there. This whole concept of inclusion is whether or not everyone that's there feels as though they're part of the team, mm -hmm. feels as though they're, they're included. Now, that's important because that's, that's from their perception. So they, and their, their perception is based on how they are treated. So that's what inclusion means. Do I feel included? Do I feel like I, I wear the uniform? I've got a number on my uniform, I'm sitting on a bench, but do I feel like I'm a part of it? I still may feel like I'm not a part of the team, to use a sports metaphor. Equity is around fairness. That's just the, um, the bottom line is, do the policies, do the processes, is the system fair? Now, this, this is very important because it goes to education. The system is the system. And, but it has impacts, it, sh it, it, it has results and impacts that show up for one group differently does, than it does for other groups, whether or not that was the intention or, or not. So in my line of work, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, I try to get companies to first, let's, let's, get, let's make sure we've got, if you want to get your fair share of talent, you have to realize and accept that that's primarily going to be women and people of color. So if you haven't been successful recruiting 
in retaining women and people of color, you need to change. Once they are there, if you want to keep them, you better make sure that they feel as though there's a future for them. When they look up to the C-suite, do they see people that look like them? Is there is there is this a place where I can be all that I can be? If they don't, they're going to leave. Particularly people that we describe as millennials. Mm -hmm. In any company, um, that's where your highest turnover is. Equity is are your HR processes, policies, procedures, how you treat people. A supervisor does he does he come in and only speak to certain people, whether it's by intent or not. The impact is, yeah, I noticed that you only go to lunch with certain people, you only speak to certain people. That may, your intent is not to exclude me, but your when, when, when you, yeah, your actions, this is the this is the way it makes me feel. It just doesn't feel fair. So, so a lot is for perception. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's perception and then there's some facts. The problem is the gap. How big is the gap? My job is closing the gap between people's perceptions and realities. It's, it may not be dissimilar to what we've heard about education. What you've heard is this gap in in in, in outcomes. Um, it is no. It is no. Let's just say this. Some of the data and some of the things they shared about reading grade levels and performance level. Companies turn to me. You know what the first thing they say? Oh, we can't find qualified people of color and women. And and what they're saying, and then of course if you when they are off camera, what they'll talk about is, well, you know, they're not coming to us with the skills, you know, and some of the deficiencies are not the, the, the deficiencies that come from their degree. We're talking about basic deficiencies. We're talking about work ethic. We're talking about communications. We're talking about, you know, uh, yeah, we want you to be diverse and inclusive, but when you come up in here, you have to act a certain way. And can you adjust? Can you, you know, um, function in a setting where you have different people, different backgrounds, and different perspectives? Or can you only function in in an area and in an environment where you where there's people that you're comfortable with. So it shows up. Okay, so let me ask you two. Is the only solution to dismantle the system? Are y'all both in agreement with that or is there a way to actually I don't even want to say at this point we're beyond fixing the system. So what are what is the thought process? Well I think that everyone knows what has to be done. You know, having a podcast that we have these conversations often a lot of people are tired of having the conversation. I have my great grandfather's journal, right? And so when I go back to the early 1900s in my mind, I'm saying, okay, I'm ha I have a tangible object in my hand where I can read the penmanship of my great, great grandfather. And he's talking about the very same things mm -hmm. in the early 1900s. And in 2021, I am saying like, wow, like my great grandmother in West Virginia was advocating for equity and for black and brown children to be able to go to school in West Virginia in 1906. So now, in 2021, I am a special education teacher and I am training my students to be their own activists so that when they're in spaces, they can say, this is what I need, this is what I want, this is what is not benefiting me. So they can articulate and communicate what works for them. But they don't have that opportunity in a system that doesn't even allow students to be at the table. Georgia has a law that says students are prohibited from being on a school board. So Seriously? we can yes, so we can pass policies that will say we can criminalize black children because of their hair, for example. That's one reason why I have locks. Because we want black children to show up in spaces and not be who they are. And that's unfair. So now I cannot have locks, or I can't have an afro, or I can't have Raised because society says that this is not good. Even black administrators, I want to be very clear, because I wrote an article about the Cab County where black administrators in their heart, they felt like they were telling black children, even though it's bad to have locks, it's bad to have afros or braids or, you know, wave your hair naturally. They were doing it because they felt like we're protecting them mm -hmm. from a society that's not going to embrace them mm -hmm. or give them a chance. And so we want them to be in this way. But again, to answer your question, mm -hmm. when do we become the oppressor? Mm -hmm. Because now we're repeating the same practices.
that people who oppressed us because we had kinky hair or because of our uniqueness and our blackness, we are also doing the same thing, but in a way where we're thinking about helping. Yeah. I'm going I'm to I'm be a little contrarian here. We don't have time to break up the system. But honestly, the system, that, that will take years. This has been 400 years from the inception of this country, from the founding documents to the amendments that have been added over the last 200 years. To think that you can change this system I think the best thing, and I think Dubois talked about it, is with the veil, you got to navigate it. Mm. And so for us, it's about equipping our kids to navigate it. And when I say that, when this organization was started in 1972, just getting kids out of high school was enough. It's clearly not enough today in our economy where two-thirds of the jobs require some post-high school certification. So now the mantle is to get them through college, technical school, the military, or if they got an entrepreneurial skill, get them to the SBA or get them to show it to the world. We're now supporting 107 kids who are actively in college, over $60,000 in educational support for tuition, transportation, and they're closer to the American dream than any of the kids in our key. When I say the American dream, that's being a homeowner. You can't change your children's educational perspective until you get a better home situation. And you're in a popular, if you go into a public school, you're in a community that has a tax base that will give you great public school options. A lot of people of color in Atlanta don't have that. Because most of us, especially in the city of Atlanta, are on that under I-20, below I-20. That's where two-thirds of APS is. And when you look there, the median income for families in APS, black families, is $23,000. But the wait, 20, wait. the median income for black families in the Atlanta public school system is $23,000, according to data from last year. Mm -hmm. The median income for white families in Atlanta public school system is 167000 So you can talk systematic all you want. If you're in a poor community, you're going to have poor schools. So it's up to, and I think one thing I love about what we do is we just don't sit in that moment. Uh, we say now we have to have collective impact. So a lot of people are bashing companies. I'm going to take, we should hold them to account. For example, Mercedes-Benz, Roar Capital, I'm going to give you an example. Roar Capital owns Dunkin' Donuts, Sonic, Arby's, um, uh, Cinnamon, Massage Envy, Meineke, a private equity firm that's headquartered here in Atlanta that nobody really even knows about. Neil Aronson came to us and said they hired a firm to find three nonprofits to partner with because after George Floyd they had their own reckoning. Like, what can we do? We're into making money, providing jobs for people, but what can we do more? So they decided to invest in us. CIS of Atlanta, Agape, and Junior Achievement. We're their first rollout. They came and gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars to put site coordinators in Farrell, Kimberly, and Bunch. They also started out, not just that, but the support goes deeper. Scholarships, now they're opening up for our high school kids, intro to private equity. Do you know how many kids don't even know what private equity is? So now, these companies are in a position to collectively come and work with nonprofits, not just for the moment. And I heard we had Mercedes Benz come to us the other day. They said, we want to do something transformational, not transactional. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment right now that we can use these allies, however they came, because they're coming with resources and there's a lot of attention on what they're doing. And I think some of them are sincere. I think George Floyd was a game changer. It was more game changing than Rodney King, and you see with how the whole country yeah. is on edge about that case. Because if it goes the wrong way, that's the brother talking about the system. It can't go the wrong way. We've seen it happen before, and I think we got to be prepared for either outcome. Because I believe many of us will get burned out if it does go the wrong way. Mm -hmm. and, and and we're in a part, we're in a powder keg moment. Ray Di Gray Dalio runs Bridgewater. Uh, associates, it's the biggest private uh, hedge fund in the world. He wrote this book called Principle. He said, the thing that keeps him up at night, this is a guy who's worth 16 billion, is income inequality. Mm -hmm. And the capitalism as currently constructed cannot go on where the wealth gaps continue. Climate change is going to exacerbate that because there's going to be lack of water, lack of resources, lack of energy. You see China going through Africa, setting up contracts to extract all so there's going to be a lot of pressure around income inequality. And if you have hedge fund guys saying that, what keeps them in, they're not poor. 
Because the haves and have you see it here in crime in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. It's not just happening on the uh, in, in areas of Atlanta. You got white people being robbed in their homes in Buckhead, in Roswell. Yeah, we had that conversation the other day. Yeah, I mean, it's not the little island. It's not, and they want to break from Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I heard that too. So, you know, these things, I tell these folks, help me educate them so they're not coming to your door at 12 o'clock at night. That's how you have to really lay it out. Well, that, okay, so let me so, ask so, you. I can, can, I, can I jump? Because I, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to go with a system dismantle, contrarian view. I think uh, I think a hybrid. And because, so let me, let me give some context. My new book. Shameless plug. How about I say she's going to put it out there, huh? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 no, because, but, it's, but, it's, but it specifically talks about this. Beyond inclusion, reimagining the future, the future of work, workers in the workplace. This is the major message in the book, that the we had multiple crises. You had the pandemic, which had a, a health component, uh, economic mental, psychological impacts, social. You had the social justice movement, which is still um, ongoing, and, and the sort of the, 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 the tectonic shifts, the awakening that's, that, that took place from that. You had the whole political season that it ended, it didn't end, but it culminated with the, the 2020 presidential election. But as we know, the election season starts two years before that. Mm -hmm. So it was divisive for two years. So we had all of this. I am saying this. Let's use that, that those crises as a platform for change. Everything that we said that you may not could do. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't dismantle systems. You can't change. This is the time to do that. I believe education, which I believe is... I was raised to believe is the is the, the single greatest hope for closing income inequality. I believe it can be changed, but as we know, it it, it can't. I don't believe it. I don't believe, regardless of who it is the secretary of education. I don't see this as a national issue. It could be. We know that education, like politics, is local. local. But I but I do have I do believe that there are models. I do believe there's models that we could take the current system and say, okay, let's take the bad parts. We know stuff that's not working, um, the things that, that that make it not work, local funding and all of that, and let's see if we can't change that. Or you could, in fact, have a MacArthur plan. This is a country that rebuilt Europe after World War II. You could, you could declare income inequality, education disparities, as a threat to national security. And you could come in with some sweeping changes, but you can't get any of that done for the obvious reasons um, that we that we that we know. There are solutions. There are solutions. You just can't get people of different perspectives, different persuasions to sit down and focus on solutions and outcomes. Let me just say this one last point. Companies hire me to find talent to retain that talent. And they're like, I don't care if the person is a Martian, but just find me the people, and we know you can't so they have a sustainable pipeline of talent that companies and organizations need. Nonprofits, government, everybody, unless you deal with education. So education is the key that has all of these implications. Um, and it shows up, it shows up on my phone every day with phone calls saying, help me, help me, help me. I'll, I'll toss it back to you. All right, so let's, let's hold this. Let's put a pen in real quick. It's Frank, like you about to bust. So we will take our second break, and when we come back, we'll have more with this panel on the Leadership and Television Show with yours, Ricardo D. Rice. When we left Dr. Zill, were you finished your thought? I, I was. I was. Okay, Frank, you thought you had something to say about that. What he said, I mean, there's been HBCUs around for 200 years. That's a whole other conversation. There was a Wall Street Journal article talked about. Now there's a focus on HB. Look at what's going on over there. Here, Microsoft is building a big innovation lab over there. This talent has 
in here. But I think what you just said was, this is the first time that there's been a tectonic movement to say, hey, we have not done right. Whether it's the funding HBCUs got in the CARES Act, mm -hmm. whether it's what, what Biden and even Trump, to his credit, focuses on the HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So now companies have to be intentional about going to those places and connect outside of the favorites. The spell in the world. Mm -hmm. We have tons of HBCUs, a and and &M. Xavier University, I think, produces more black uh, pre-med uh, than any other school in the country down in New Orleans, Louisiana. FAM had more black national merit scholars than Harvard had at one point. So these are value. I went to Johnson C. Smith University. Also fraternities and sororities have been around for years, hundreds of years in some, some instances. So there's always been talent. There were seven Jews. My fraternity's founders, Alpha Alpha, were at Cornell in 1906. So we've had blueprints. I think now you have the systems open to listening. Yeah, and yeah. doing something about it. Well, yeah, yeah. listening. I don't know about doing something. But well, listening. let me see. I, 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 I switch back a little only because we've heard we've heard the stories before. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from a two parent household, and we lived in the middle class. Like I, I I've seen how those dynamics work, mm -hmm. and I've been very strategic in how I show up in spaces. Mm -hmm. And so, being in education, and I've seen children that are targeted. They are strategically labeled mm -hmm. so that their tenure through third grade third grade through the rest of mm -hmm. the public education system is in turmoil it's in chaos mm -hmm. and we're watching these kids intentionally be pushed out mm -hmm. and everyone plays a role in it and so you know I, I was able to interview Anand Gares who wrote uh, Winners Take All in regards to how corporations and companies can you know play a, a role in writing this wrong mm -hmm. and it it's the hard conversation about dismantling systems. People don't like to hear that phrase, mm -hmm. just like they don't like to hear the terminology of defund the police. But we were comfortable with defunding education for so many decades. And then we'll cry about, oh, the crime in Buckhead. Mm -hmm. Well, sweetie, when we were telling you 10 years ago that we needed funding for reading teachers, no one heard teachers mm -hmm. and no one was listening to students. Mm -hmm. And that is an issue that we have not listened to the people that are being impacted the most I like the point about HBCUs and all of the nuggets within the black culture that we have that have helped us to gain some momentum towards equity. But the larger conversation is we're not reaching the masses. And we think about, you know, what the boy said in his, you know, debate with Washington and so many others. You know, I, I go back to the blueprints of activists and leaders and those who, you know, build bridges in different areas, right? What are we going to do with all of this knowledge to change? Like there has to be change, but we don't want to have conversations about reparations and how these companies really need to be fixing the issues around housing, around technology. Ask these major charter networks in the city of Atlanta. Charter organizations play a major role in how we change public transportation, public health, mm -hmm. um, you know, the public housing crisis that's here in Atlanta. Atlanta is one of the most inequitable cities um, in our nation. And when we look at, you know, my brother T.I., he graduated from Frederick Douglass High School the same as me. And so I, I get it when he says, you know, Atlanta is Wakanda, right? It's this black mecca. And that's what we want it to be. Um, but we have ignored too long the atrocities that have happened to black and brown people in this city and it's been swept under the rug because we have an allegiance to power and we have an allegiance to corporations that help fund a lot of us who are able to escape the police brutality because if we're real about the fact of the George Floyds and the Trayvon Martins they're not middle class black families that live in Cascade they're not middle class black families that are in suburbs and in communities where this is not happening. It's happening in communities that are targeted with poverty, which begets crime, which continues to false narrative on black on black crime. When I've worked in places from Douglas County to Fulton to Atlanta to Clayton, and the dynamic is the same where it's the stereotypes that perpetuate a lot of these issues in systems that we already knew that these things were here. And so we have a bridge that could be made where we see more 
equity in spaces where people who have influence, such as these brothers, who have the you know the capacity to make change, that will impact what teachers like myself are doing in the classroom, we will see a reduction in crime. We will see a reduction in children not being able to have good customer service because quite frankly, they don't have the communication skills to deliver that. And so, you know, one of the things that I push that may be of interest is even with communities and schools, how are we partnering with schools? And how are these corporations coming in and they're not just seeing us dressed up in suits, but then they're also seeing us in the community where we're doing projects. And this is environmental health. And this is what, these are the jobs that connect to this. So we, we look at the everyday things a little bit differently in how we partner and collaborate. I, that's the raw capital partnership is exactly right. That's groundbreaking for us because I told Neil Harrington, I said, we're not just doing this just so they can work at Jimmy John's. We want them to be able to start a private equity firm and get the, the tools to do what you did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we took kids to the governor's mansion a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and Governor Deal and, and First Lady Deal gave us a tour and we were in there saying, hey, don't just be caught up in the chandeliers. Mm-hmm. Get comfortable with being in this house as the governor because mm-hmm. nobody who looked like you has ever lived in here as the governor. So it's about also, uh, you know, I come from a single parent home. Uh, there's personal accountability, there's relationships, there's organizations like myself, there's mentors, there's a whole cascading right. ecosystem right. there right. if you avail yourself to it. Mm. Uh, uh, and so we got to get from systematic lane to personal responsibility That's sometimes good. too because we have a lot of parents who even if they're not educated, they are loving their kids and doing the best they can and going to work every day, and they just can't make ends meet. I have no problem with that. Um, but they're still responsible. They still respond to us. They know that Johnny's not in school. They're running with us to get Johnny. That's good. It's the one. I think parenting in our community has collapsed. A lot of parents are overwhelmed with mental health issues that are not being addressed. With, with, with un, unmet health care needs. How about the prenatal issue? You talk about systematic stuff. More black women die having babies regardless if they're educated or not. Mm-hmm. We, we talk about early education where studies show that the brain poverty has an impact on children's ability to learn down the road. Some of the stuff is too late. Yeah. The word gap by time kids get to preschool is 30 million words because we're not reading to our children. So there's a mix of personal responsibility, there's systematic oppression, but there's been, it's been Dubois, and there's been great black people who still persevered through this American sojourner and still gave us blueprints on how we can get our other people out too. I, I, I don't think it's hopeless. So, okay, so let me, let me shift to Shelton really mm-hmm. quick. And we talked about this when you were on like season two about having another, some kind of version of affirmative action that says to companies, okay, there's only 4% or a number that small of CEOs of major headquarters that are here in Atlanta. Do we need something like that, a new affirmative action type thing that makes them say, hey, you need to find this talent and it needs to be in these C-suites by XYZ. Is that what we need? Would that help? Is it possible? Well, or do we need to clone you well, you know me. I'm, I've got a hyper bias for results, and I'm and, and I'm willing to listen and talk about and explore anything that brings about results. But I'm also a realist. When you say corporations, you got all different types of corporations. You've got you've got private equities that that's and, and those folks you know is owned by a few people, and they they're not accountable to anyone. You've got companies that are owned by shareholders. And what, as a shareholder, I want my stock price to go up. Yeah, that's the number one priority. If, if, if I'm a regulated utility, I mean, if I'm a regulated company, I mean, you got different companies. So there's not a one size fits all. But, but, I still, my aspiration is still that we need to find a way to, to, to put people in leadership that understand these things. The problem that we have is the people that are making the the decisions on behalf of of their customers or suppliers or shareholders, they don't understand this. I I have people look me right in the eye and say, Shelton, I'm a 56-year-old white guy. You know, I thought Zoom was a Commodore song. They don't know about it. 
They don't know about these things. They, the, 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 the outcomes and the results from, from the public policies fall disproportionately on people of color, on men of color, on black men. Um, and, 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 and people, they're just now getting to the point where because of the George Floyd murder, they're at least now saying, gosh, maybe maybe these guys are right. Maybe they're not just making this up. Maybe it's me who has have kept myself intentionally ignorant because I didn't want to because I didn't want to feel fearful or guilty or the you understand what I'm saying? That's and so you ask me, I don't want to just shift out people at the table where you don't get different outcomes. Right. What I'm hoping is that by putting people who I grew up in North Philly. I went to a private school, but I had to walk 17 blocks through gang territory to get there. To get there. Right. And then and then I was tired and I was hungry. Right. And so and so the and so they fed me. Right. You understand? But but they didn't give me a bus token to put me on a, the 61 bus so I can get safely back home. It was like right. once you're here, we'll take care of you. But getting here and getting back, right. that whole ecosystem, That's they were Jesuits. They just didn't get it. That's they just didn't get it. And I know somebody's out there saying, Doc, you're giving people a pass. But I talk to people true. every day. And no, I don't let them off the hook. Right. But but they just don't get it. So what you know what? Okay. If you need it, you need to get it, or we need to put people in place who do that that get it. And and so you know people. And I'm not trying to I want to introduce politics into it, but I believe having a a, an Af, a, a woman who happens to be African American and, and Asian heritage gets you different outcomes than you do with people that. From it's the e- At least that's so what he just said is so powerful because we don't have enough of that. You know, it's our perspective on how we think about things. It's, it's also the assumption that every black person it's understands cool. yeah, what poverty means. Sure. That every <laughs> black person <laughs> understands what it means to grow up in the hood, and they don't. Because I didn't. I didn't understand that until my father lost his job in corporate America because he was in a car accident. And they said, okay, yes, you know, you didn't heal in two weeks. Well, that's it. And I didn't know what poverty felt like until we left our nice home with more than one level and driveway and car here and this there. And I'm used to getting what I want. And now we're in the hood. And that was devastating. I still remember that. So I know what it means to come from, right? Having means to having nothing to where we were in Bowen Homes, right? And you could not go outside. Oh, Big Mama, like, they, no, there's no going outside after 6 o'clock. It's still light outside. I remember that. Now, I didn't dwell there and live there for, you know, a long amount of time. But I was there. And I, I, I remember people fearful of their siblings going out in that because there was a reality that they may not come home. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm a teacher. Mm-hmm. And being in the public school system, I realized that that's not the testimony of all of my students. Mm-hmm. Some of them come from very nice households on very, you know, nice parts of town, but they're being abused at home. And that's a totally different dynamic than what's happening in other places. And so I'm sharing that to say that we need the right people in places who are willing to bring change to spaces where it has not been before. And that doesn't just mean putting any black person in place. For example, with Profound Gentlemen, we stand for... We need to make sure we have brothers of color or, or male educators of color who are social justice minded so that I can ensure that I'm training them to be the next CEO, but I'm also training them to be the best blue collar, or white collar or pink collar worker that's out there because you need someone that's going to make sure that the possibilities are out there and not limiting children in classroom. I, I, and I think it's uh, I'm a phone in between. It. It's something big and true. Black people don't, aren't CEOs of major companies here in Atlanta. Uh, Chris Womack is about to take over Georgia Power, which is actually a subsidiary of Southern Company. Um, and that's probably the biggest CEO move that has happened here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's it, 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 just being real. Yeah. Um, what I have learned is that I went through this program called Leadership Atlanta. And you get a chance, it's 3,000 of the top leaders from corporate America, nonprofit, you name it, entrepreneurial walks, who go for 80 seats. It's very competitive. 
Uh, in my class, I had the CEO of Accenture North America. I had the general counsel of Georgia Pacific. I had a federal Fulton County judge, leaders of law firms, the managing partners. And it's going to take those types of intentional engagements where I was able to build a relationship with these people. So now I could go to Jimmy, who's at Accenture, and he gives, he's going to mentor a young lady that we got through Howard and she works for him in Virginia, didn't even know her. Imagine what her trajectory is going to be now, mm -hmm. that the CEO of Accenture is going to be her mentor, mm -hmm. black woman out of Howard, walking in the door. So it's about using your influence mm -hmm. for good. You know, I can have conversations with Jimmy that now reflects how he's talking to his employees at Accenture. Raw conversations. Mm -hmm. But it takes relationship building. I used to work for a Republican senator, Arlen Specter, and he used to tell me all the time, from Philadelphia, he used to tell me all the time, nothing gets done in Washington unless you cross party lines. Mm -hmm. But today's political calculus will get you killed, which means nothing's getting done. Good. And now we're at a point where this paralysis shows up in an infrastructure that's decaying. Right. This paralysis shows up in a public school system that wasn't even able to adapt to the, the, the weatherizations and stuff you needed to have kids in a place safely right. because it was all outdated and lead pipes, uh, uh, giving out water that wasn't clean. Now we're at a reckoning point with right. race, right. with what just happened and what's happening to the Asian community. More importantly, what just happened in the state capitol right. with the voting rights law. Oh, my yes. These are all, but I, I also got a good God who's walked people and minorities through worse situations and people who were displaced in worse situations than we are. And we also have blueprints. You have a Jay-Z now, and you have a LeBron James who's taken his platform and now he just bought into the Boston Red Sox. You have a different dynamic now where athletes who used to be Michael Jordan ish and just keep the sponsorships are now putting it on the line. Mm. And not afraid of the backlash. That girl, uh, Naomi Saki, would have never wore those face masks naming the murdered black people to the U.S. Open without this moment. So I'm telling you, this moment's real. I, I, I'm going to be with him. You got to hold to account. But I know personally in our world, we have companies walking up who would have never thought about investing in us and are sincere about their investment. Neil Anderson said, we're looking at this just like we bought Duncan. There's no difference in how we're looking at this investment because we want to make transformation is the new word now. Not transaction. It used to be take a check and give, give you $25,000. Yeah, that's real. Yeah. And black leaders, you should just go out there and take the check. It's yeah. not me. I tell them I don't want the check mm. because it's deeper than that. Because mm. right. it's easy for me to get the check and you go off and nothing changes. All right, right. so we're going to take our last break. We've been all this discussion. In the last segment, we're going to talk about solutions. What do these solutions look like? Where do we need to start? How does that work? So stick around the Leadership and Television Show with yours, Ricardo D. Rice. So I'm going to let these gentlemen give their final thoughts about everything we discussed, and then we're going to get into solutions. So I'll start with Dr. Good. I'll start with you. Uh, again, um, I'm, I'm hopeful because I believe that, the, as I said before, the crises, when you put them all together, it, 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 you have people at least listening. Now, they're not necessarily maybe talking, which is the next step to solutions, but at least they're listening. Now, I, and, and again, Turn off Fox, turn off CNN. I'm not talking about the stuff. I'm talking real here. I'm talking to people that are that are contacting Icarus and saying, just like you are, what can I do? And I says, okay, um, let's make sure we're not talking about just writing checks and stuff like that. We're looking for sustainable. What we need you to do things that you are willing to sustain because it takes time for change. So you, can you... If you say, if it's something that you can't do by yourself, do you? Have, what, what I'm asking you to do is to make three or four phone calls. Make three or four phone calls. Together, three or four or five. Can you imagine, just imagine this. Imagine if Tom Fanning 
called my man over at Delta, called UPS, called Home Depot, and uh, I don't know if anybody else called Truist, and then you got a couple folks that are coming to town, Microsoft, some others, and says, let's us figure out how we can take Atlanta from being the highest income inequality city for two years, and let's change, let's begin to change that around. What can we do together? Do you, can you imagine? Could you imagine if he facilitated that conversation, the sort of solutions yeah. that you could come up with? It's gotta. You got it. We got this. We got this opportunity. Some kind of way, we've got to leverage it. Yes. And I know what's happening right now. People, you got people already on two on two sides of the divide. Boycott or not boycott. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, oh my gosh, we can't afford that. Right. What we need, we need, we need those folks in the room with good public administrators, with good educators, and say to help us with some solution. We can't fix everything, but doggone it, we can fix some zip codes yeah. right here in Metro Atlanta, yeah. and let's take six or seven zip codes and let's 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 let's, let's let's concentrate so that in two years. We can point and say, That's "This example. is different." Right. It can be done. Yeah. It can be done. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful in America. I'm hopeful because we built this country. We're not going nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be a reckoning, and you're going to have to deal with us. And I think what we see up in Minneapolis will be a big indication if America has grown to that challenge. Because if that man is let off after what happened with George Floyd, it'd be hard for me to look my two babies in the face who watched that, like so many of our babies who watched, they call it uh, murder porn. Uh, that's what you call it because it was successions of just murders that you saw all summer long, whether it was happening here in Atlanta with the young man over uh, 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 at the Wendy's. Richard Brooks. Richard Brooks, whose daughter is on our caseload now. Uh, she's on our caseload since that happened. Um, or what's happening across the nation. Um, this is a pivotal moment. I, I, I saw Roz Brew the other day because in, in the midst, Roz got a huge job. She's now the CEO of Walgreens. First black woman to run a major Fortune 500 company of that size. And she said, at this stage of my life, it's not about celebrating that one thing. Right? Mm -hmm. It's about making sure after I leave this position that there are 20 other Roz Brewers. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's where I'm at right now. It's not about fighting and changing systems. So it's taking these babies almost like a, a single mindedness like Harriet Tubman, taking them out of these hoods and getting them to somebody's college campus where they get there and they graduate with the least amount of debt. If they don't go to college, taking them to somebody's technical school where they can go to free for 16 trades here in Georgia that are under, don't have enough people to do them from the movie industry on down. Right. Right. To the military, if that's a better right. place for them because they right. need to get out of here and get some discipline and be right. in an organized setting. Or if they got coding skills, can cut here, can do here, can do nails, get them a chance to start their own small business. That's the only pathway I see to getting poor black and brown kids out of this mess. Mm -hmm. Because then they'll be able to be full participants in the American dream. When I say that as a homeowner, because when you own a home, you treat it a little differently. You treat that, you don't just throw trash down in your home. Mm -hmm. When you're a taxpayer, you have a say, and you will worry about who's spending your money in Congress and at the state and local levels because you're a taxpayer, mm -hmm. not a tax bird. Mm -hmm. Full participant in the American dream. And mindset change, exposure. All of us said we came from I went to a Catholic high school, too, changed my life. That All of us ain't going to have that. Mm -hmm. That ain't going to be the majority way that us, we get out the hood. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have to be used in the public schools. And what I'm saying is we have to do what we're doing at CIS, and that's collectively impacting this thing. Bringing government, bringing corporations, bringing individuals together to do something that we cannot do. And, and CIS in Atlanta has been called the oldest practitioner of collective impact. And I think that we have to take that to the 21st century and do it even bigger. Mm -hmm. And I think Roar Capital, we just had Mercedes-Benz join our board. Uh, we just had Jones Law Mill LaSalle, which is the biggest real estate, commercial real estate brokers in the world, join our board. Uh, and these companies see value in getting into a transformational relationship with an organization that is right there in all the areas that are suffering the most. All right, so you don't get to wrap up. Let's go into, let's go into solutions, and 
I want you to explain from your aspect, when we say dismantle the system, what would that look like? Awesome. So I'm a big champion for dismantling the system because it's not currently working. I always give this analogy. Now, when we think about how technology has advanced things, in a sense, it's dismantling old things and creating something that's new. It's a process of innovation, and so it's a wordplay. Too many times we get caught on the words, and so whatever makes people comfortable, we need change, and we need common sense practices. Mm -hmm. This is what my students talk to me about. So my hope is seeing you know these young people that are in the backdrop making this happen, seeing my students that are saying, we don't want to just hear the same old conversation mm -hmm. about do this and do that. We want to have a stake in this as well. Mm -hmm. And so reimagining schools starts with giving students a seat at the table, mm -hmm. for them to say, this is not working. Why are we going back to traditional models of, okay, you get up at six o'clock in the morning, you get on martyr, it takes you an hour, maybe an hour and a half to get to school, mm -hmm. then you're hungry, then you're this. Mm -hmm. Why are we not reimagining schools in a way where all children to a certain age are getting foundational skills right. and skills kids are able to go to a program. If I'm an artist and I do graphic design yes. or I do media, yes. that's my focus. I don't yes. want to learn algebra two yes. and all of these other things that these studies are they have been out for the last five to seven years and have said our traditional models are not working. Right. So here's my pitch. We have communities and schools, we have profound gentlemen, we have so many other organizations that are needed. We need to create spaces where there's true partnerships because we do need the Fortune 500 companies to help change the financial aspect and also, you know, the exposure for the jobs. But so we need, this, sorry, go ahead. Let me ask you this. So is that a conversation that needs to be had with superintendents to make that space or is this the school? Superintendents are employees. It's convers it starts school with boards. boards. And so school, school boards, boards are just as political. When we look at Atlanta, everyone's looking at who's running for mayor. No, we don't. Who's running for mayor or city council? But we're not looking at school board. We have one young man that's on Atlanta school board right now. And so it sounded like, are we expecting him to be the voice of all black and brown people, to be the voice of all people who are disenfranchised? Because as the chairman of the board, I can assure you, he's listening to the influence of COVID and these other entities that are in the city that play such a role in these schools. That's property. He's talking about, you know, property taxes, right? It's the funding formula. So you want a solution? We need these same companies saying, listen, we have to change the funding formula in Georgia. Where does that start? People don't understand it. It starts with the governor. Yep. The governor appoints a committee of people who do not look like any of us in this room. There is one sister, and I think that she is retiring and leaving because it's so overwhelming for her to be that voice for over, what, 500,000 families in the state of Georgia who are disenfranchised, who have all of these needs, and no one is speaking equity except for her. Yep. And so we have to stop doing that to our sisters as well, that now we just want to elevate, you know, black and brown people in these positions and they have no support. Yep. So solution means that we need reparations in the sense of let's spread this economic access yep. so that now we have black owned media companies and people that are in positions that can say, listen, school boards, we want to see some change. We don't want school, schools going back to a schedule where kids are not being served. We want some flexibility. What about school in the evening? What about schools on the weekend? What about schools that are actually at Fairbank, right? Because they actually have a school, but it's for a certain select group of kids. And we need that access for all kids. So those are solutions that I see that will work and intentional partnerships of making sure that we have all voices at the table and not just the people who we hand selected think should be at the table. His new system is not zero sum. That system would benefit everybody. So, yes. so I know we're here and we're a black men's panel, but too, too often when we discuss our issues, they sound like in order for us to do better, somebody else has to do worse. Right. But what he is proposing would benefit a lot of people. It would, it would benefit so a lot. So he is trying to focus on the school boards and in theory yeah. as part of and, it. And supporting. I mean, how many, how many school board members, I'll be honest, you know, I've invited a lot of public school board members to come to Atlanta and have one-on-ones with me. Listen to what my students are saying. Now, I've had council persons that have done it, um, civil rights attorneys, you know, corporate leaders that have come and talked with students. So now I want school board members from Atlanta to come to Atlanta and sit down with students who are the water boys, who are in dis disenfranchised communities. So you can hear them say, listen, 
you made these partnerships with communities and school, but it was too late because you all you had these bad policies that our, they had already pushed me out. Yeah. So now I couldn't get the help. I couldn't see the blueprint because the policies it started policies play a major role yeah. in how teachers even function. Yeah. So if I know that I can target a student and know what like police officers, it's the accountability. It's self accountability, but it's collective accountability. And we have to hold parents and I tell my students, you play a role in this too, because now if you go out here and pick up a gun and you shoot and kill someone or you rob someone, the baby you know better. Because I told you better. I don't care what your parents may not have done or they did, you heard right from someone. Yep. And so that self-accountability yeah. piece is yep. very important in this shift because yep. if the corporations do the work, if the leadership does the work, and the people aren't doing anything, then now we wasted money and we wasted time and we have more people who are against change yep. because the people who need change then yep. step up and also do the work. Yep. Right, well, the solutions. I mean, I'm just hopeful of these types of conversations mixed with what you're seeing outside. I mean, there's real things happening um, on the ground, national conversations that would have never happened, uh, placements on tickets that would have never happened at a national level. Uh, but we also have a lot of challenges. And I think it's going to, to your point, all this thing doesn't matter if we don't have empirical data showing that it's getting better. And I think it's now time not just to hear and have them listen better, but have metrics that everybody can be held to account to. Uh, because everybody's promised, oh, we're going to have X amount of people in our board. We're going to have X amount of people. I don't get that up to this point. But what if they're the wrong people? What if they get in there and they are just happy to be the one? You know how we get. Sometimes when we get to the top, we happy just being the one. Yeah. Um, my hat's off to you for yeah. providing an alter, oh, yes. alternate platform. Yeah. See, we, we, we're not on, um, you know, CBS this week yeah. or, you know, this week with George Stephanopoulos. Yeah. We need alternate platforms like this to get out. You heard three reasonable people have a discussion that not only talk about issues, but talk about solutions. Thanks to you for giving us a, an alternate platform yeah, to, to get the words out. It's, it's un, unfiltered that you can really yeah. be thoughtful. All right. I'm not going to let them, if I strike another nerve, they can keep going. So I'm, <laughs> this is a good place then, so I'm not going to strike another nerve. Thank you to my guests, uh, Jason, Frank, and, and Dr. Good. And uh, next week, I can't remember what we're talking about. Check the website, ricecommunity.com. That's Rice with a W. And we will see you next Monday, same time, same place, on the Leadership Event television show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice.